provide it with some discursive grounding. <coughs> One is a speech that he delivers at the inaugural exhibition, and that is subsequently published in the newspaper, in the opposition newspaper, Sada' al-Ahali, under the title, The Renewal of Painting, Tajdid al-Rasam, Tajdid fil rasam actually. In the speech, he distinguishes the artwork from the other images of modern life, from family portraits, paintings of European landscapes, pinups. He compares himself to a writer and what he is doing to writing. He says, quote, art is a language. We must get to know this language. What is a painter trying to say with his words, his words that are colors, lines, and shapes? He says, modern art, fan al-hadith, is the art of our time. It expresses many things. Worry, fear, the discrepancy between things, massacres, alienation from God, end quote. He says that the artist, quote, expresses faithfully what is going on around him, but he has to know how to realize that expression, end quote. The second document produced with the formation of the Baghdad group is a manifesto. Employing the political and existential language of Baghdad in the 1950s, the manifesto introduces painting, Fan al as a, quote, solution to the problem of freedom by creating an awakening. Uh, uh, yeah. The manifesto claims that this painting does not yet exist. It is a new thing to be realized. Uh, thus it draws a line, marking off the painting it seeks to bring about from what had been done before in Baghdad. It establishes the zero <coughs> year of modern art in Baghdad, the speech <coughs> act of the manifesto. The manifesto offers a method for realizing this new thing. Referring to a practice of manuscript illumination in medieval Baghdad, it points to, sorry, the solution to the problem of freedom. You can see the quotes for yourself. Referring to the practice of manuscript illumination in medieval Baghdad, it points to the fact that, quote, the first steps have already been taken by the artists of the 13th century. That the new generation will find the beginning of this path already laid out. This creates a special situation in which, quote, the modern Iraqi artist bears the weight of both contemporary culture, the Kafat al-Asar, and the imprint of the local civilization, Taba al-Hadar al-Mahdiya, end quote. The manifesto framed the situation as an issue of style, stating that, quote, work that is simply done in modern styles does not solve the problem. What we need is creation that admits new elements into our styles. The manifesto then invokes Picasso as a paradigm. Quote, Picasso, the artist of the time, who has become part of the basis upon which modern art stands, would not have gone to where he is without passing through stages which revealed to him how to search for new elements in its sources. It was not in vain that he sought out the primitive art of Andalusia, then African art, and then the work of Impressionist writers as the first steps leading him to what came to be called the Cubist School, end quote. The manifesto then went on to announce the, quote, the birth of a new school of painting that similarly joined to the art of the 20th century something heterogeneous to it, such that it would be possible to, quote, re-erect that great field of painting that collapsed after the emergence of the school of Yahya al wasati in the 13th century and in this way to restore the chain of transmission interrupted by the fall of Baghdad to the Mongols." End quote. So my paper departs from this invocation of Picasso in the Manifesto of the Baghdad Group for Modern Art. And my argument here will be that in Baghdad in the 1950s, where a small number of artists were attempting to establish a practice of modern art outside the historical circumstances in which that heart, art had arisen, Picasso was more than anything else a name meaning that it functioned to clear a space for a practice of modern art that was not located in Europe. To these artists, Picasso demonstrated the capacity of the modern artwork to open itself up to other traditions. It made it possible to conceive of difference within the artwork. In order to make this argument, I want to look at a painting by Jawad Salim. Maybe you've seen it. <laughs> a, woman naps, a woman naps on a mat in a walled courtyard. <coughs> It is a private space, and the sense of a private space is created both by the fonts of the palm which fall out in what looks like an empty uh, quadrant in the upper right, and the way the tiles seem to rise up uh, as if we are looking down from above. The woman's body is twisted towards us, 
responding not to our gaze, but to its own desire, is a body in a dream. The triangular profile of her right breast, outlined in black, creates a kind of rigidness. To one side of the rigidness, her neck is tilted, her head resting on her arms, her hair thrown back. To the other side, uh, from the sharp geometry of uh, her upper chest, her torso slopes down to her hips, which are full, sensual, voluptuous. There is weight here, beneath the, the white-hot glaze of the cat. The right thigh falls over the left. It creates shadows. So the surface of the painting is organized into geometric shapes, across which different colors are distributed, uh, arranged compositionally, without regard to referential representation. And then the, this geometrization is interrupted by the, the vitality of the figure. In a book entitled Iraq Contemporary Painting, published in 1977 in a number of European languages, English, German, Spanish, it's remarkable, uh, and thus addressed to an international audience, and written by Salim's brother, this painting was juxtaposed to a painting by Picasso, to which an easy comparison can be made. Can anyone identify this Picasso? I, I couldn't identify it. No one. He doesn't okay. like blue? No, yeah, this no, is a Picasso label. painting. Um, in any case. It's from the 50s, but... Well, I want to begin here with a comparison that is neither of my own formulation nor the prejudice of Western eyes, but that is in fact produced by the artist Brother Nazar, uh, who wrote the text. We don't know what exactly is supposed to be similar, the geometric organization of the picture plane or the iconography of the recumbent woman. But what we see here is that the problem of similarity and difference is located in the artwork itself, is posed by its structure. I don't want to dispute the existence of a similarity, nor do I want to identify what that similarity is. Rather, I want to identify the difference. Again, because I want to argue that Picasso is the name for difference, for the potential of the artwork to displace itself. What we have in Salim's painting, is a, this is what I want to argue, is a revival within the modern artwork of an older history of painting. This, I think, is evident if we look at the pictorial concept of the painting. My intention here is not to deny an influence, but to get around that question by examining the structure of the painting and determining what in it is singular, what is irreducible to an influence. I will try to show that if Selim's paintings look modernist, they resemble modernist painting, that is because they revive a pictorial concept outside the Western tradition of illusionism, and modernism is the undoing of that tradition. So this painting belongs to a series of work that Selim did between 1949 and 1958 entitled uh, Baghdadiyat. The title conveys the sense of scenes of life in the city. And different drawings and paintings in the series consist of arrangements of figures engaged in a variety of activities, both in public and private. The paintings in Baghdadiyat are characterized by a common set of features. One is that the scenes recur across different medium, from drawings on paper, to ink on canvas, to oil painting, suggesting that they have an integrity, an existence independent of any individual work as a kind of motif or mythium. I'm sorry, I don't have a slide demonstrating this. It's not for a, second. Uh, a second, as we see here, is that the modeling of the figures is geometric. The teardrop face, the triangular neck, the elliptically shaped limbs, and this modeling is standardized across the paintings in the series. Thus, it functions not as a deconstruction of volume, nor as an interpretation of particular bodies and space. Um, thirdly, the space, surrounding, uh, <coughs> thirdly, the space surrounding the figures is reduced to a, to a plane divided into compartments or a pattern of shapes. When we look at this study, we see that this patterning, I'm sorry, I was hoping for that big screen we had yesterday. <laughs> Um, we see that this patterning is not a geometricization of uh, space. We see that the lines organizing the ground plane are conceived as continuous with the lines uh, composing the figures, uh, such that the lines exceed the forms, the figures they give uh, form to. So for example, you can see that uh, the line that produces the trunk of 
of the palm then gives rise to these arcs that structure the space around these, these musicians. And you see how you know, the lines that, uh, that, that figure the woman uh, exceed that rep representation. They have this kind of internal momentum that then uh, uh, integrates the figures uh, into uh, this kind of grid work. Um, across which then the colors are distributed in the manner of a composition rather than a representation, a uh, mimetic representation. Now, in his book, in his book Picasso and Truth, in his recent book Picasso and Truth, T.J. Clark characterizes cubism not only in terms of the undoing of the Western pictorial tradition of illusionism, as he had done in his earlier writing on Picasso, but here he considers the ways in which the collapse of space that defines illusionism is an apprehension of the grammar of objects in the world. Draws on Wittgenstein to do this. And, and thus, cubism is a claim about truth in the world. He first maps out the grammar of the object in Picasso's cubist paintings, and then tracing the dissipation of room space after the First World War, when the room is invaded by the outside, uh, which comes in literally through the window. And then he follows Picasso's subsequent attempt to rethink space and body in this exterior. Uh, and in that exterior, the body lacks a grammar, it becomes monstrous, and thus true in a different way. Um, and that monstrosity is, in fact, he says, a more profound truth about the human being, uh, such that by Guernica, Picasso has achieved a grammar for rendering horror as this common public, as a common public experience of the devastation of war. That's the arc of Picasso, of Clark's argument from Cubism to Guernica. This is Cubism and its trajectory, according to D.J. Clark, in his recent book. Now, what I want to underscore here is the way in which Cubism and its aftermath in Clark's account, at least, is the painting of objects. And then I want to ask if we can say the same thing about Baghdad yet. Is this a painting of objects? So Clark poses the question, uh, rhetorically, uh, what was Cubism then? And he gives two answers, one shallow and the other deep, he says. He's trying to build up to the point that Cubism is embedded in a form of life. Um, Quote, okay, here we go. The shallow answer settles for the set of devices. It is concerned with their pictorial grammar, their way of simplifying some aspects of the visual world and complicating others. It reduces all forms to a hard-edged geometry and pushes these forms up closer and closer to the picture plane. It locks their edges together into a network or a rough grid. Cubism works on the surface. Cubism was an art of procedure. Here is where the shallow answer, the description of cubist grammar, slides into the deep one. Cubism proposed itself as a view of the world, this is all Clark, and its view of the world, as with most such proposals in painting, hinged on a sense of space, the gun form of cubism, the sense of a shape of things that spurred it on, uh, the form of life implicit or maybe explicit in its deep structures. The cubist gra so the cubist grammar is a grammar of objects, uh, the interest in space, hard-edged geometry, they're about the grammar of objects in the world. Uh, so here's Clark again. Cubism's world has the following structure. It wishes to state again, this time definitively, that the world is substantial through and through, with space only real, only felt, to the extent that it is contained and solidified. Physical reality is something the mind or imagination can only reach out to and completely, for objects resist our categories. And painting can speak to this ultimate non-humanness of things very well, but only by giving their otherness the form of a certain architecture, a certain rectilinear, indeed cubic, constructedness. The world is a set of instruments, utensils, asking, us, asking for us to reach out and take them. It is property. <coughs> now, the, the Western pictorial tradition of illusionism originated in the Renaissance program to constitute painting as a science by subjecting it to the laws of nature. Subjected to the laws of nature, painting was obligated to a kind of mimesis of the physical world, and thus a painting of objects. Illusionism is a painting of objects. Now, is a uh, is siesta a painting of things? It's a question. Is siesta a painting of things? What do you think? I'm asking you. No. No. Anyone say yes? Anyone make an argument say yes, it is a painting yeah, of things? It is. <coughs> Tell me, what in what ways? <laughs> Three things. Four things. 
Okay, let me see if I can let me see if I can disagree with you. I mean you disagree with me. Okay, I'm gonna say no. <laughs> and it was kind of staged for no, but it's not a painting of things, but we can discuss this. Because in that idea, there's absolutely no sense of an object on the other side of the paintings. Um, the forms in the painting do not elaborate a grammar of objects. They are not the reduction of an appearance, uh, the transposition of an object's physical properties into the camera. Rather, each form is conceived in relation to other forms. This is, this is the argument I want to make about reading this painting and the others. In this way, each form being related to other forms, uh, they have the nature of a language. Not in the sense that Clark characterizes cubism as a language in terms of grammar, as a syntax of the world. Rather, a language in the, in the high structuralist sense uh, that there is no referential relation between a signifier and a signified, that signifiers refer to each other along a chain, with signification only occurring across this chain. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, you know, we saw already that Salim understood art as a language, um, uh, but as, as expression, not grammar. Uh, and that's the production of meaning. Now, here in the nature of Selim, uh, here in the nature of form in Salim's painting, in its essential non-referentiality, we find ourselves outside the Western pictorial tradition. What I would like to argue is that what we see here is the revival of the pictorial concept of a 13th century tradition of manuscript illumination. So, um, Salim had first gone to Paris to study art in 1938, but within a year, while Salim was still uh, in a kind of primer in Paris, Germany invaded France, he relocated to Rome, and then when Italy entered the war, he was forced to return to Baghdad. A number of things then happened in Baghdad that structured the subsequent development of modern art in Iraq. One was the discovery of a history of painting in Baghdad that Salim didn't know about. <coughs> Sometime in 1941, he came across an article in the French picture magazine, Le Illustration, which reproduced a number of illustrations of the Maqamat of Hariri made by Yahya al wasiti in the 13th century. The manuscript containing the illustrations had surfaced in 1899 upon the death of Charles Schaeffer, a French diplomat and orientalist whose, collections of manuscripts were, whose collection of manuscripts was acquired by the Bibliothèque Nationale. In 1938, the manuscript containing al wasitis illustrations of the Maqamat along with a number of other illuminated manuscripts from the collection, was exhibited at the Bibliothèque Nationale in an enormous exhibition curated by Eustache Deloré and Henri Corbin entitled Les Arts de l'Iran, les Anciens Pères de Baghdad. It would be very interesting to compare that exhibition to today when Baghdad was included in the Iranian world. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway. Uh, in order to distinguish among the manuscripts, Deloré and Corbin uh, created a typology of schools. So the school of Bahzad, Temerit, uh, kind of Temerit school, school of Tabriz, and then the, the Baghdad school. Uh, the Baghdad school, uh, Ustash de uh, claimed in the, the catalog, which is really a book, um, for the exhibition, was the apex of Islamic painting. And al wasitis illustrations of the Maqamat were its greatest work. The greatest work of Islamic painting right here. Of course, something called the Baghdad School never existed. Uh, but still, there had been, in fact, a practice of manuscript illumination in Baghdad, one that derived from a Byzantine tradition. Uh, and that's something that Eddinghausen traced in that book, Arab Painting. And that history of painting reappeared in the article Salim encountered. Secondly, that winter, uh, in 1942, Salim met a group of Polish soldiers garrisoned in Baghdad who had studied art in Paris under Pierre Bonnard some 20 years earlier. Salim wrote exuberantly to his friend um, that meeting these artists had brought about a revolution. He said Mkalab, but you know this Mkalab revolution cool these days. Uh, okay, so um, he explained that when he had been in Paris, he quote, wasn't so interested in painting. And at the time, quote, painting was dominated by P Picasso, Matisse, Braque, and, and Dali. Jouad wrote about this revolution uh, in his painting. I don't have a slide quoting this, because it's not. 
uh, I just have you know do, I have to do due diligence to the Iraqi art historiography here. Uh, he says, I now know what impressionism and post-impressionism are. I now know what color is and how to use colors. I've begun to understand the pictures of Cezanne, Renoir, Van Gogh. But more than that, I've learned the sanctity of work, the value of time. We would work all day from beginning to end without interruption. And in the evening, get together at the Café Brasilia to restage the, the French Café with our, to recreate the French Café with our long debates. We'd call this Café Dome, and we would discuss everything, and we were the last ones to leave the Café. So the Polish painters are often credited with moving the artists in Baghdad away from academic painting. But the letter indicates that what they did was to enable the recreation of an art world during the war, an art world independent of Europe. We don't have El Husri's reply to Jawad, but we know from an essay he published in 1958 that he had been antagonistic towards the possibility of Impressionist painting in Iraq, simply because the country lacks the atmospheric variation uh, and the modulation of color and light to which Impressionist painting responded, uh, supposedly. Uh, in Selim's rejoinder, uh, however, he cited El, El Wasiti's use of color, my major piece of evidence in my argument. So, read with me if you can see. In every country of the world, Jawad says to his friend, El Khaldun, there is color, even in the land of Babam and the Eskimos. <laughs> my friend, the whole world is color. Even in the moment when you are before our streets, it is filled with color. Take Yahya al Wasati, the greatest of the painters of Iraq, which you call Void of Color, the land of the, the palm tree, the date palm. He has externalized it, he has eternalized it in his, in his pictures and color, or better, eternalized himself because his pictures were different from what he sees in front of him, because he creates his pictures. I don't think you remember the picture, Atta Sabri enlarged of Elwasati's from the collection of the Naqamat of Hariri. It is a picture that represents a group of camels. This is the, the image. And it was actually in L'Illustration, uh, that article uh, uh, that De Lorey had wrote and that Celine found in 1941. So it is a picture of a camel, a picture that represents a group of camels and the camels of Iraq you know very well. Their color is not the color of dust. Rather, this great genius paints each camel in a color appropriate to the color next to it. The letter evinces a very close examination of the illustrations reproduced in the article. And it suggests that the illustrations offered something of a model to Salim. He identified two characteristics in, in El Wasati's painting, that there is an essential difference between the picture and the world, right? He says, um, he says to Khaldun, uh, because his pictures, Awasati's pictures, were different from what he sees in front of him because he creates his pictures. And secondly, uh, that the color in the picture is determined not by external reference, but by its relation to other colors in the picture. Unlike the Western tradition of illusionism, the pictorial tradition in al Wasati's illustrations was not based on reproducing appearances. Rather, what the illustrations sought to render was something else, something organized in, in the text, uh, something that they sought to render visual. And the illustrations did so within a tradition of producing an image from a text that went back to antiquity. In al Wasati's illustrations of the Maqamat, and the Byzantine tradition of manuscript illumination from which they are in part derived, there could be no question of a perspectival relation to their subject. The illustrations were made on the margins of a text, on the same paper upon which that text was transcribed. And in the case of Yahya al Wasati, with the same hand. He was both the calligrapher, the transcriber of the Naqamat, and the one who produces the illustrations. Right? Um, uh, so these images are produced in the margins of the text, on, on, on paper, on a surface that one didn't see through, but read off. And so the pictorial concept in al Wasati's illustrations might be described, I would like to describe them as a, as a metaphorical operation, rather than a, a mimetic one, or a metonymic one, uh, in that they render, they, they render on a visual register what had been developed in text. So this metaphorical operation consisting in this shift in registers. 
So I, I meant in here. So Salim saw the illustrations uh, from the standpoint of the artwork that had uh, emerged in 16th century Europe out of its transformations of the medieval devotional image. I think Salim's painting reproduces the pictorial concept of al wasati's illustrations, displaces it into the, the artwork. We, we can maybe disagree with me, and I'd love to, we can go through it. <clears throat> and I think this is evident in certain non-referentiality in the series Baghdadiyat. So let me go back to uh, Siesta and, and point out this, this non-referentiality, just quickly, just a, a closing gesture. Um, but let me first go back to something that D.J. Clark says. Uh, so, Clark says, what makes Picasso truly the artist of the century, in other words, is his absolute faith in the here and now of pleasure and sex. The here and now of pleasure and sex. And the painter's craft. And his absolute lucidity about the circumstance in which these things were now on offer. So sex in Picasso was about bodies in rooms, bodies available to the artist uh, as objects. Clark goes on. His world, Picasso's world, was of property arranged in an interior, maybe erotic property, but always with bodies imagined in terms that equate them with or transpose them into familiar instruments and treasures. Continuing with Clark, Somewhere at the heart of, hu of being human, Picasso's art tells us, is the moment when bodies present themselves as so many bearers of roundnesses and orifices, things to suck or suck with, to bite, to penetrate, to swallow whole. Now, in Salim's painting, can we, can we say that this is the body of a woman that Salim ever saw? And they got that here and nowness. Do we, see, do we see that in that painting? Or is the body modeled as, uh, as a body unseen? And I'll, I'm going to stop here. Uh, and just, I, I think that uh, what I'm trying to understand is the way in which um, the, the body of the woman is, is functioning to uh, organize uh, desire and it, because the, the same kind of way of producing the, the female body occurs across his, his, his work. But I'm going to leave it there and uh, because I still am trying to understand um, what's happening here. But what I hope to have shown um, is that the similarity, if we go back to the slide, the juxtaposition in the 1977 book, that the similarity was in fact the outcome of a difference. Salim's painting resembled European modernism because modernism was the negation of the Western pictorial tradition of illusionism. And his practice of painting, based on the, pra uh, based on the pictorial concept of velocity, was outside that tradition.